Yeah, so without further ado, we'll get started with this um, heavy metal soil contamination in West Atlanta session. So here today with us is Dr. Eric Saikala, who is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. She's also the director of graduate studies and the Emory Climate Talks program in that same department. She received a Bachelor of Engineering and studied chemistry and biotechnology at the University of Tokyo. Master of Public Affairs at Indiana University Bloomington, where she studied environmental policy and natural resource management, and a PhD in the Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy program within the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. So welcome, Ari. Great, thank you so much. It's so great to um, be able to give this talk virtually. Uh, it's unfortunate that we cannot see you all, but um, I'm very excited to be sharing this talk with you. So let me just start my uh, slides. You can see okay? Yes, we can see. Great, okay. So um, today what I'm going to be talking about is uh, in collaboration with a lot of different um, stakeholders. So that includes Historic Westside Gardens Atlanta Inc., EPA, Georgia Department of Public Health, and ATSDR. Okay, so um, I was hoping to ask you all um, who is um, who has heard of or who is aware of what food desert is, but it is a little bit difficult to um, get participation via Zoom sometimes. So I will just go ahead and explain um, what, what this map is showing is um, the area where the residents do not have a car and do not have the supermarket store within a mile. So what this is showing, um, if you are seeing the darker color, then that is more than 10% of the residents um, do not have a car and supermarket store within a mile, having a lot of difficulty getting fresh produce. Um, if you are in the Atlanta area, uh, you might be aware that there are uh, a lot of community and urban gardens um, popping up. There are apparently 300 community and urban gardens um, that this map is showing. Um, and because of COVID, uh, I've heard that there are so many more people starting the urban gardens or gardens in your backyard. And one of the reasons is to alleviate this food desert problem that I just mentioned. The city of Atlanta is also trying to um, tackle this issue. And what they came up with is called Atlanta. Um, I'm showing you this. Uh, this is a digital food hub um, for urban agriculture that the mayor's office of resilience initially started. And this is great because, um, you know, if you can actually have agriculture in the urban areas, you can also tackle a lot of food desert problem that we have. But one of the problems is that um, in the city of Atlanta and then in many different places, um, soil tends to be contaminated, especially in urban areas. And so there are problems with heavy metals sometimes, mineral pollutants, organic compounds, et cetera, that are listed here. And um, the regulation, there's no regulation to be testing your soil before you start growing food. And that can be a problem because you might be growing food in your backyard or in the community garden, even though this might be an issue and you might not be aware of it. And so what I'm going to be mainly talking about today is heavy metals and metalloids. I'm including metalloids that is having the property of both metals and uh, non-metal, and that is especially true for arsenic. The other ones are the metals, uh, chromium, lead, and cadmium. These have high density, uh, and what the main issue with them is that they can be very toxic for your health. I'm showing you the health impacts of lead exposure here. Um, sometimes people are exposed to lead and have no symptoms whatsoever, but um, especially with kids, um, they could be having some abnorm abnormal pain that you don't realize that this is actually because of lead exposure. Um, and then you could have headaches um, that doesn't necessarily have to be coming from lead. So all I'm trying to say is that there are so many different health impacts potentially coming from lead exposure that we might not be aware of. 
And I think one of the very big problems with lead is that it can affect uh, the IQ scores. And um, that can be very detrimental for children. Once you are exposed, uh, unfortunately, the um, exposure is something that you cannot get rid of. So if, if, if it has impacted your brain already through this process that I'm showing you here, um, that there's no way back. Uh, you can make the exposure less so that it's not going to get worse. But it is really important, I think, that we are doing everything possible to prevent the exposure before it happens because of the issues. So what this is showing is what happens in our brain when you are exposed to lead. So um, I'm not a neuroscientist in any way, so maybe many of you would know this better than me, but um, in our brains, there's a lot of signaling going on using the electrons. Uh, and what this is showing in the normal brain system without the exposure to lead, then uh, there is um, transmission possible. The signals are sent the normal way. But then if there is an exposure to lead, what you can see is that it blocks the signaling mechanism. And so then uh, your, your brain is not able to operate as it should. And so this can affect your neural development, and this is especially problematic for children. It can have a lot of impacts on planning, setting future goals, and can be um, causing behavioral issues as well. And because of the IQ loss due to this process, children could have issues at school. And I think this graph shows very well uh, what could happen to the population. Um, at the top is the normal distribution of how, um, in the normal circumstance, how we would see the population, about 6 million gifted and about 6 million with intellectual disability. This could shift because of the exposure to lead, increasing the people with intellectual disability because of this lead exposure. And to me, um, if this is happening to the most vulnerable population, then this is making it even harder for those that are already impacted by various other reasons. And so this is something that I think we really need to be working on to um, get rid of. So I've mentioned a lot about the health impact. Um, so how we can potentially measure health impact um, is via blood lead levels. So you can collect your blood samples and then see how much lead uh, might be in the blood. And then there are various um, uh, numbers that you're seeing here, the blood lead levels. And even though at the smaller level of less than five micrograms per deciliter, so this is currently used as a CDC uh, Centers for Disease Control reference value, uh, we know that even at the very low level, lower than this reference value, children can be impacted uh, with different cognitive performance as well. And then obviously, as you see, if you get really high acute blood, uh, blood lead levels, acute um, exposure, that could even get to death. So where does this uh, source come from? Obviously, I already alluded that that can be in the soil. And you can see that here um, in the number 15, contaminated soil where children could play and food is grown. But that is obviously not the only uh, source. Uh, many of you might be aware that, you know, in some traditional cosmetics, this is number one, uh, can have lead. Uh, it was used uh, in the past by the Romans um, in the wine as well. So this, there was a lot of use in the past as well. And leaded paint was something that was very popular and it got banned um, in the 1970, 1978. Um, so if your house is built before that, then it could have uh, leaded paint that could be causing exposure as well. Another potential source is the, um, the gasoline. Uh, so the leaded gasoline used to be uh, very popular. Um, that's number 10. And leaded gasoline became uh, widely available in the US in 1978 or so. But the actual ban only took place in the 1966. And there are some areas that um, in the world that still have uh, leaded gasoline. 
So you could uh, have been exposed that way as well. So just to put everybody on the same page about the current standards for lead. So what are actually being done to prevent this lead exposure? Um, uh, there are no safe levels of lead for children. As I've mentioned, even at the um, very low level, it could have an impact uh, for children. So we really want to do everything possible to reduce the level. And um, I believe that lead exposure is preventable. Uh, we can reduce um, the exposure. And then I think knowledge is power, doing everything we can, being aware of where they might be and trying to avoid them pushing for the ban. I think that's it. That is what we have to do. So um, hopefully after you hear this lecture, you will be all for talking about it and trying to um, have the preventable strategies so that uh, less children will be impacted. So as I've mentioned earlier, the blood lead level content that is currently set as five micrograms per, uh, per deciliter, I don't know why there's no D, but it's supposed to be deciliter, it's not liter. Uh, that's the CDS threshold for action. Um, the airborne content is 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter. It could also be in the air as well from the waste incinerator. It could be coming uh, from the air. The drinking water, many of you would know Flint incident, uh, so that is 10 micrograms per liter. And the soil content is 400 ppm. The ppm stands for uh, micrograms per gram or um, grams per kilogram um, that you can be looking at. Sorry, it's not, um, so it's milligrams per kilogram. Okay. So why, uh, why are we talking about this? Um, is that 2,333 Georgia children actually test positive for lead exposure. And um, what I mean by that is that those children have more than five micrograms per deciliter in their blood when they test. And this is quite um, not abnormal. Um, there are quite a few areas in the US where children test um, higher than five micrograms a deciliter. And we've usually been focused on uh, leaded paint uh, as the primary source, but um, my, my lab started to wonder how much it would potentially impact if we were to go for urban agriculture in Atlanta. And so that was how we started the seed grant. So the target area here, um, many of you would know where Georgia is obviously. Uh, and then, so this is Atlanta. Um, and we've been targeting the historic west side. Uh, this is the greater Atlanta. And this is where we've been targeting. The reason being it's a low income and primarily African-American neighborhood. And there was a lot of historic uh, industry in the past as well. So I think that this uh, map hopefully summarizes our problem. Um, what I'm having here, this is the work done by my student, Sam Disler, who just graduated and took, uh, received uh, highest honors this past May. And her honors thesis was looking at the um, this bloodlet levels and where are the people that are, where are the children that were potentially vulnerable that are not being tested. So what she did here is to first, um, the color is showing the median household income. So that lighter the color um, is the lower the median household income. So you can see that the area that we are looking at, especially where we um, put in red, um, these are the areas where the median income is uh, one of the lowest in the greater Atlanta region. And the bubble size is the proportion of children under six that are currently screened. So you can see that 0.25 is the maximum in any of these um, areas that you're seeing. And the color is out of those children that are tested, how many of them have higher than five micrograms a deciliter. So the brighter red the color, the more children being tested higher than five micrograms a deciliter. And so in this zip code 30303, this is the downtown Atlanta. Um, this is where we found 13% of kids being tested have higher than five micrograms per deciliter. We think that this is extremely high and there should be um, something done about that. And we were also curious uh, from this that not many people are being screened. 
And so if you look at it, um, this is showing for the kids uh, between zero to 12 months, um, zero to 11 months, sorry. And then this one is showing from 12 months to uh, 23 months. Um, you can see here that in 2000, we were really not doing a great job of screening children. It has improved. Um, this is the proportion of children screened. So the more numbers of this you can consider as zip codes. Um, so you, we want to see more zip codes screening children at a higher percentage. That's not necessarily happening, but you can see that the color is shifting. The blue is shifting on this left-hand side towards the right-hand side, um, both for uh, the one-year-old and the two-year-olds. And so we went ahead to test the soil to see if this exposure could be coming from soil. And so um, this figure is showing how many uh, out of the samples um, that we had from this, this, these different sites, um, what was the lead concentration level that we found. So these three are the background sites. These are the rural sites outside of Atlanta. Um, they all had very low uh, lead levels. And we were able to measure 11 residential spaces. And you can see um, that they vary quite a bit. And the five um, urban farms in Atlanta. I wanted to point out, I've already mentioned about 400 ppm that is being used by uh, the EPA uh, as a screening level uh, for residential spaces. But the University of Georgia extension has another um, gardening or agriculture screening level that is 75 ppm. So three of the residential sites were above the 400 ppm. That was very concerning. And what was very um, saddening to us was that most of the sites were above 75 ppm. Um, as I've mentioned, Alana is a city, so we would expect um, to be that this is the case, but we were not quite expecting that three of the sites uh, would be so much higher than 400 ppm. And as you can see here, um, the two of the sites that were growing food um, also had higher than 75 ppm and we really wanted to see what might be the problem. So out of these three sites, there was um, two sites were next to each other, and we happened to find that across from that lot, there is an empty lot, and that had mounds and mounds of these um, rock-looking things. And this happened to be what's called slag. This is the waste material that separated from metals, um, mainly most likely from smelting of some sort. And so um, this was causing a lot of lead contamination in the neighborhood in the west side of Atlanta. So we were able to measure that. And uh, when we measured the soil right underneath it, um, that was actually higher in terms of the mean compared to these rocks themselves. When we um, crushed them and did the measurement, um, that was about the same, but the mean themselves were slightly higher, meaning that the soil themselves are impacted by these um, coming from the slag. And this was higher than 1200 uh, ppm. That's considered uh, dangerous. And so we have, um, we contacted the EPA. Actually, what happened was um, myself and another EPA colleague of mine, um, Tim, was um, at the tomato festival when the community partner brought the slag, uh, asking us if that might be contaminated. And so EPA was already informed when, when this happened. And then um, with the help from the Georgia DPH, it led to the EPA site investigation. So this is the West Side led uh, site investigation that is taking place right now um, because of the slag dumping. So it started with about 35 sites uh, around where we found slag. And now um, the second phase uh, it expanded to about 360 lots, that's the purple. And then now we have this um, further expanded coverage of about 1068 lots. 
And I believe that um, we've already measured several sites that are outside of this boundary that had higher than 400 ppm. And so we are unsure um, how big or how, um, how far this um, problem might be um, within the Atlanta or within other areas. So I've already showed, shown you some of the results that we had, but there are two different methods that we use to test the soil heavy metal contamination levels. One uh, that I've been showing you so far is done by XRF or X-ray fluorescence. So this is a handheld tool. Um, it emits X-ray, uh, X-radiation, as you can see here. And what it does is it excites the electron that's within the, the shell. And so it goes out and then as it goes out, the one that was in the outer shell comes inside and then uh, releases the energy. And so by um, measuring that, you are able to see how much um, of this metal exists in the substance that you're looking at. We also use uh, in the lab uh, from the other um, Emory lab um, in collaboration with Dana Barr, um, use the inductively coupled plasma with mass spectrometry. It's, it's called ICPMS. So in this case, we are going to, uh, we actually digest everything. We use acid to make into a solution. And then uh, we are able to use that solution where all the soil has been dissolved. Um, using the plasma to make them into ions and then use the mass spectrometer to detect how much of the ions exist for each of the heavy metals and metalloids that we are interested in. So as you can see here, um, the two methods differ and so the correlation is not always great. Um, here for lead, um, is actually pretty good. And we are confident that uh, XRF is able to uh, get the correct number. And this is very important because XRF is a much uh, less costly um, method to measure. And so EPA uses XRF as well. And we are hoping that we can do more testing that I'm going to mention later using XRF. Uh, for arsenic, chromium, and cadmium that I mentioned earlier, um, XRF does not seem to be able to capture the correct value. Um, and so then if we did want to know how much they, they exist in the soil, we recommend that we use um, ICPMS. And this is the work that my previous student, Sam Peters, did for his dissertation. And he was very instrumental in um, figuring out this lead issue in the neighborhood um, and bringing it to the EPA. So um, I've mentioned that ICPMS is able to get to some of the other uh, heavy metal contamination. And so we were able to do the, uh, do the analysis for 38 samples. We had about 250 samples that we did for XRF. And for ICPMS, we were able to only uh, have several of that uh, subsample because it's more costly. Um, but what we found, um, so when we took the subsample, we obviously picked the ones that we thought that there might be higher um, con concentration levels. And so those were uh, all, all higher than 400 ppm in XRF, and they all turned out to be higher than 400 ppm in the ICPMS as well. Um, what I'm showing you here are the values that we should be worried about. Um, this is by the EPA, the first one, and then the second one is the UGA extension standards. So there are two standards that I've mentioned. The cutter here um, is uh, if everything was higher than the EPA standards, then I'm having it as um, high, the, this cutter, the very dark red. Uh, zinc is in a lighter red, and that is because everything was higher than the UGA standard, but uh, nothing was higher than the EPA standard. Uh, the other ones that I'm showing you in this orange color is that some of the samples were higher than the UGA agricultural standard levels. All the blue ones uh, are the ones that were both lower than 
uh, the EPA and obviously, I'm sorry, <laughs> lower than the UGA, so obviously lower than the EPA as well. Um, but I think we do have to be concerned because zinc was uh, higher and then chromium, uh, copper, selenium, and cadmium, uh, some of the samples were higher than the um, agricultural standards. We also wanted to know um, how much people were aware of this issue. And so we did the survey um, in the, uh, at one of the Atlanta Science Festival events that we had. And also we sent out the surveys to different folks. And we found that um, the gardeners, um, most of them were gardeners and they seem to have been very concerned or concerned about the heavy metal contamination. What was interesting to us though, was that when we asked them if they were concerned about their own backyard or their own community garden that they work in, they said, no, they are not concerned, even though they hadn't tested. So we uh, found that some of the sites that had high levels, um, those were the people that were actually growing food. Um, and um, it was very uh, extremely um, heartbreaking for me to um, find that one of those sites where we found higher than 400 ppm um, was actually one of my friend's uh, children's garden. So children were playing there, children were um, putting plants to grow and eating without knowing any of these um, health impacts. And so I, th I really think it's so important that we are all aware and before we grow food, we test if this is um, the adequate thing to do. And going back to the survey results again, um, we also were concerned um, if there was any racial difference. And it turned out that um, Black or African Americans were more concerned um, than the white or Caucasians. And um, if they were uh, involved in the community garden or home garden or both, they tended to be more concerned about um, the heavy metal contamination. And this is the work um, of my other um, honors student, uh, Lauren Ballatin. She got the highest honors two years ago and already published this in a journal. So then I've been talking a lot about children playing in the um, garden or backyard. So we do worry because children can um, eat accidentally the soil or uh, some people have pick up behavior where they like to eat soil. And so if you do uh, consume the soil that is contaminated, then they can be digested and absorbed by the intestines, the stomach and the intestine. And so that can lead to the bioaccumulation of heavy metals in your uh, body that we do not want to see. So that is called bioavailability. And how can we test bioavailability? We obviously would not be having kids ingest the contaminated soil. So we would have to do the experiment to just uh, see how much would be taken up in the similar, um, similar conditions as in the stomach and the intestine. So we create that condition in the lab and then see how much is taken up uh, in those conditions. For stomach, it's about pH of 2.5. For intestines, it's about pH of seven. And then we see how much is actually digested in those samples. So that um, test itself is called bioaccessibility, meaning how much of the soil samples within it are getting uh, taken up in those conditions. And I'm showing the four heavy metals and metalloids that I've been mentioning, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and chromium. Uh, the blue is the stomach uh, and the intestine is the uh, orange. So lead has a pretty low bioaccessibility, which is a good news. Uh, it's about 7% of the total soil being um, taken in in these conditions. But you can see that cadmium um, is pretty high in bioaccessibility. So from our study, it's nearly 60% um, that will be taken in uh, from the soil. So we, we've, I've told you that um, there, there are problems in the soil in some parts of Atlanta. Uh, what can we actually do? So the EPA investigation site that I've mentioned if you are within that boundary, EPA is willing to come test your soil for free. 
And if your level is higher than 400 parts per million, 400 ppm, then they would be excavating your soil for free. But if you are outside of the boundary or if you're inside the boundary, but lower than 400 ppm, then we want to do something because even if your level is 394 ppm, that's what we had recently, you're not going to get the help right now. And so what we've been testing is, can we use phytoremediation or phytostabilization, you mean, meaning using plants to take up the heavy metals? So here, um, this is the example of phytoextraction. What this means is that these dots are the heavy metals. Uh, we can think of it as lead. Um, this, what's called hyperaccumulators, are able to actually take up the heavy metal and then bring it to their um, the shoots and um, leaves and fruit. So the pros are that they can remove heavy metals from the soil. Um, and then the cons is that the effectiveness with this uh, is associated with how bioaccessible that is. So that's what I was telling you. Some of them are bioaccessible and some of them are not. So the lead is pretty low in bioaccessibility. And so then we really have to find plants that would take up pretty well. But phytostabilization is very different. It is mainly on the roots, as you can see here. And so this is to accumulate everything in the root and then to immobilize so that they don't move. They, don't, uh, they are not in the, so the soil anymore, um, the, the bare soil. And it, this could decrease the resuspension or leaching of the um, metals to the water, for example. But um, the cons is, are that these plants obviously grow and die. And then so to keep it long term, you need to be uh, planting continuously and then to monitor how it's doing. So we've done this experiment um, of sunflowers. Sunflowers are known to be hyperaccumulators. So this is the work by Alicia Wun. She was a master's student uh, that did this work last year. And so she planted um, the sunflowers in different um, plots. And then when we measured the before and after, we saw that the soil lead actually reduced after the experiment. So we did that both in XRF and the ICPMS. And the decreased value uh, was about the same. So we were able to see about 21 uh, ppm of lead being reduced. That's not much, uh, but you also have to see that the start point was actually not high. So we wanted to see, can we, uh, if it's higher than 75 ppm, that's the standard for agriculture, uh, can we bring it back? This might be something that we can try to move it below 75 ppm. And we also conducted experiments in the greenhouse using various um, plants. So I've mentioned already sunflower, but there are different plants that could potentially work. So we did global, globe amaranth, cowpea, Chinese cabbage, and this was my other um, master's student's work, Xingyi's work, uh, that she did in the greenhouse. So she collected the pretty high soil, lead level soil, uh, from this empty lot where we found a lot of slag. Uh, it was about 500 ppm of lead, and then um, homogenized the soil and then put them into plots, uh, pots, and then grew different plants. And we did that in this greenhouse because the level was high and we didn't want people to be in touch with uh, these high contaminated soil. And after the experiment, uh, you can see here, this is how much the concentration went to different parts of plants. So as I've mentioned, it was about 550 uh, parts per million of soil at the beginning. A uh, cowpea showed a very good distribution inside the plant, so it took up quite a bit of uh, lead. The maximum went over 80 pp ppm, milligrams per kilograms is ppm. And then uh, the lowest one was about 35 ppm. But you can see that compared to other plants, um, there were quite a few that went to leaves, stems, and flower, uh, not, not much on flowers, but leaves and stems for cowpeas. For the others, cabbage did a pretty good job as well, but most of them stayed in the roots. And amaranth and sunflower had much higher, uh, much lower levels, and sunflowers is about the same as we've shown you, 
uh, 20 ppm, um, again, in the root. We've also tested um, the compost and the what's called EDTA to see so these are the chemical and biomass amendments for sunflower to see if we can actually remediate better. So the compost uh, can increase plant biomass, meaning that it can uh, have more plants to grow better. And so then by increasing the plant biomass, um, that could potentially take up or immobilize heavy metals more in the soil. And for EDTA, this is the, um, how the EDTA is. And when there is metal, uh, it combines and creates this metal EDTA complex. So you can think of this M of, as lead, for example. So when this um, produces this complex, then it can be taken up by the plant much more easily. And so we wanted to see if this was a possibility. And so when Xingyi did that, we, saw, we found that EDTA did actually increase uh, the concentration um, to be taken up so much better than how it used to be just by sunflower. And then uh, it actually went to the flower parts as well in this case. So we saw uh, about 50 or a little bit over 50 ppm taken up by adding this chemical amendment. Um, with compost, it actually didn't um, increase the concentration uh, as much as we had hoped. Okay, so the conclusion. Um, there are no safe levels of lead for children, as I've mentioned. And if this is the one thing that you're going to take from this talk, I will be very happy. Uh, so please remember that um, you're, you do not want to expose children to any of the lead levels. Um, there is no safe level. Uh, lead exposure is preventable. Um, only about 20% of children are currently screened in Georgia for blood lead levels, and 2, 000, more than 2,000 children are having high levels in their lead, blood lead levels. Um, and so we are finding high lead, zinc, and other heavy metal and metalloid concentrations in urban soils in west side of Atlanta. And I do want to um, make sure that we all know about it and we will do some, something. We can do the testing, for example, that I'm going to talk about. And I think phytoremediation is showing an, uh, to be a pretty good effective strategy. This is very low cost. Um, and so that is one good thing. Obviously, um, we still have to do much more um, tests and um, at the site to see what plants could potentially work. And for the cowpeas, you might remember we had a very good result in the greenhouse, but we definitely do not want to um, bring that to the field yet because uh, we were finding that they could actually go to the actual cowpeas that you would eat. And um, if the kids were to eat that, we found that that would be uh, very detrimental. So those are still the things that we are testing. And since this is um, the, the citizen science project, uh, I wanted to end with a note um, so that everybody can participate in this event. Uh, what I am proposing is a community science soil shop uh, with various partners that I have. So that includes Georgia Department of Public Health and ATSCR. And I'm also hoping that um, Georgia, so Georgia Department, um, Georgia Environmental Division has been extremely helpful in setting this up as well. Um, and what I would like to do, and I would love to hear what you think about this, is that um, you know we're, we are living in this COVID world. Before this, um, my students and uh, anybody that were interested, we could have done the soil sampling together. But now it makes it very difficult. But at the same time, there is so many more people starting to uh, grow their own food. So what we are proposing is why don't we screen your soil um, by you collecting the soils themselves, yourselves. And you can either ship them to us or you can um, drop them off at different points so that we can send you um, the results. We are still uh, in the, the stage where um, 
we are trying to finalize the details. So I, I kind of wanted to run it by you all who are participating in this, if you could give me any feedback on what you would think is more feasible. Um, we have actually created a website um, and so that more information will be available. I, I am still having it with password protection, but we will make it available um, soon. So this is the QR code for the website that will be available very soon. And how I would like you to participate is, as I said, um, I would like you to prepare a sample of your soil. We will have a video that you can watch to uh, collect the soil samples. That is the video made by the um, ATSDR, so that is Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Um, and then uh, we would like you to fill out the questionnaire per sample. Uh, and uh, just, just because we don't have equipment, we are asking that it would be two samples per person. Um, and then the questionnaire will be asking you about where it's taken from, uh, et cetera, so that we can see uh, once we have the results that are concerning for us, we can go back and retest, et cetera. Um, and then we are, we are trying to make this also um, on the web because I've heard from several people and it's the same for me. Uh, right now, um, it's quite difficult to get access to a printer sometimes. And so we think that it's probably easier if we also made the Google form online where you can fill. So what you would do is you would um, take the sample and then you would um, mark your sample ID on, the, on your sample in the book Ziploc. And then um, before you send it or drop it off to us, you will fill out the questionnaire to tell us about each of the samples. And then you can mail it to my lab um, at Emory, or we are also trying to work with different drop-off points over Georgia so that uh, you don't have to be shipping. So I also wanted to um, thank my group members. Without them, I cannot do anything. Uh, and so this is actually a pretty old picture. This was taken last fall. Obviously, we are not able to meet physically anymore, so I don't have a picture like this. But I have a very diverse uh, set of students that I'm very proud of um, in the PhD, masters, and the undergraduates. Um, if any of you are potentially high school students wanting to come to Emory, you are very welcome. And uh, I especially want to give a special shout out to um, these folks um, that have contributed a lot to what I presented today and also in collecting soil samples to make this work possible. And of course, uh, I have so many collaborators that I need to thank. Uh, so Gil Frank, Rosario Hernandez are from uh, Taranja Alvarado, Chris and Arthur, they are all from Historic Westside Gardens. Uh, and then Tim and Sydney are from the EPA. Uh, Frank and Faith are from DPH. Lian is from ATSDR. Abby and Nathan are from PESU. Um, and I have uh, great Emory colleagues, uh, Dana, Barry and Priya, Candice, Melanie, and Erin uh, that helped me in this Hercules project as well. And of course, I would like to thank the funding agency. Uh, and of course, thank you all for listening. Um, and I would like to open up for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ari, for such an informative presentation. Um, it was really awesome to hear about all of the remediation efforts and I'm very excited about the soil shop project and it seems like some of our uh, viewers are too. There's quite a few questions about how to get involved. So um, we can start answering some of them. Um, so John Butler asked, since you're focused on the west side of Atlanta, can these soil samples for the community science project come from anywhere? How about Gwinnett? Yes, I think, uh, well, thanks to Jenna and Bailey, uh, we are trying to have this uh, in Georgia. Uh, and then, you know, we can try how it works in Georgia. And then I'm hoping that we can make it national <laughs> at some point as well. But uh, we will definitely be able to have it from Gwinnett. Great. Yeah, I know that's super exciting. Thanks, John, for your question. Um, 
we have another question from Christina, and she's wondering, with phyto, with phyto remediation, do you have to dispose of the plants at the end of their life cycle in a specific way? This is a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. Uh, yes, so if you do have a very high lead levels, it is concentrated in the plants. And so we cannot just be having them composted uh, or um, going somewhere else. And we did actually uh, found that some of the compost were um, contaminated potentially because of that and also potentially because of bringing native soil. So the best way um, is to be burning them, making sure that you are not um, having the ash going mm -hmm. out. Um, we definitely don't want to be um, putting it into, well, I guess you could be uh, throwing it into the trash can. But I think um, my, in my ideal world, um, if we could get energy out of this contaminated plant uh, and then getting the ash to be uh, thrown away to the landfill um, where we wouldn't have access, I think that is probably the best way, but um, you, you definitely want to be careful. Thank you. Um, we have kind of two related questions about sampling locations. Um, so Johanna said, I love the citizen science project. Can we send more soil samples from other parts of town other than our backyard? And I think also maybe um, aligned with that is, you know, sites that aren't gardens or sites that aren't, you know, um, growing food. Yes, you can totally send uh, soil from anywhere, especially like if your kids are playing or if you know if you're uh, uh, worried that that site might be contaminated, it definitely does not have to be a garden. And I think kids often play in a non-garden place as well. So we want to be uh, just testing the soil where you think might have high contaminations. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and then, yeah, there are some other questions. So maybe just some clarification, are you inviting soil samples samples for testing from any county of Georgia or are we just focusing on the Atlanta area? Any county of Georgia, anywhere in Georgia. <laughs> it doesn't have to be Atlanta. Atlanta might be easier for you to send, but um, yeah, we will hopefully have uh, drop-off points all over Georgia so that you can participate. Oh, I forgot to tell you though, um, since we are not like, uh, you know, this is going to be a free event, uh, hoping that a lot of you would participate. So you do have to bear with us in terms of the response time. We will do absolute our best to get back to you, um, but then and we cannot promise to give it back uh, at the very uh, quick um, turnaround. Great. Um, Johanna has another question. When the EPA tests a site and heavy metal concentrations exceed 400 ppm, are communities that are affected notified? Yeah, this is a great question. So um, the EPA cannot tell anybody other than the actual resident uh, how much the level was. Um, I think this is the privacy issue. And so the community cannot know how much each of the parcel is, if that is the, what the question is. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is interesting. Okay, uh, Trish has a question. She's asking, what is the source of the slag you found on the west side of Atlanta? Yeah, so we are actually looking into where that might have come from. My, my guess is that it has come from the lead smelters. I've, I've heard or read that uh, Atlanta used to have about 10 to 11 lead smelters in the city. And so I have a feeling that they might have been dumping, not intentionally, because this used to be considered to be a very stable product. And this is used as foundational material, uh, which is a very bad idea right now, but then they didn't know. Uh, but it is also possible that this might have come from other places. Some of the residents in the West Side actually alluded that they might have come from Alabama or somewhere else. They said mm -hmm. that there was a big truck that came and then dumped all of them. So we are still unsure and trying to figure out. Wow. Mm, okay. Um, Mo has a question and it is, could you compost and use in non-food gardens? Oh. I guess they're talking about the-, the I think the plants at the yeah. beginning, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, but I think that um, since the kids could still be 
in the non-food gardens. Um, I think there is a worry that it could still be contaminated. Um, so I, I think it is better that we don't use that for your backyard in any way. Thank you. Um, and then Trish also has another question. What should we look for as potential sources of lead in our community? Yeah, so I think the potential sources of lead, the major ones are the soil that I mentioned. Uh, the leaded paint is still uh, potentially a big problem in the old homes. Um, um, and then the, I think uh, the water could potentially be a source as well. Um, and so those are probably the three major sources. Uh, some of the toys, if they, um, if you are not a U.S. citizen and coming from different areas of the world, like myself, then um, you could have different sources as well, like leaded gasoline, if you know it's still not banned. But that really depends on where you live um, and what types of products you use. Thank you. Um, Anne has a question. Uh, she asked, can we send in soil from our creeks, like the creek that she's watching and monitoring for Adopt a Stream? Yeah, so I, I actually did uh, really think about why don't we do both <laughs> soil and water <laughs> at one point. But I think I am spread out a bit too thin at this point. So I think I do want to focus on soil first. And then if we do have some more funding where we would be able to have more manpower and more equipment, I would totally love to do it because, you know, as, as we've mentioned, um, this is not just coming from the soil. So it would be nice to be able to have a mechanism where we can find where that might be coming from, not just say soil and water, but also air and from the paint. But we are not, we are not quite there yet. So <laughs> when that happens, I'm sure uh, we will work with Jenna and Bailey to make that happen. Yeah, um, so just to clarify that a little bit, so you can't, when, they're not going to send you water samples, but they could send you soil samples from the oh, site okay. next to the creek where they- Oh, I see, I see. Yes, 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 of course. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Great. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we do have a follow-up question from Johanna that asked about um, EPA notifying the residents. So she says, does that mean that schools and people who work there will not be notified, only private residents are notified? Oh, okay, so um, so actually, I, I believe that EPA did test the school. Um, I think they told me that EPA went to test the schools, uh, and then they didn't find uh, higher than 400 ppm. What they are um, testing right now is mainly the residential lots. And so it's not a communal area. But that's a very interesting point. Like what happens if it was a communal area? I actually have no idea. Um, yeah, I mean, you would think that, I mean, yes, private land is private land, but it's part of a broader community. So if there's your next door neighbor has contaminated soil, you probably do too, and you would want to be notified. So that's very interesting that um, they don't share those results. Yeah, I think I think it would have been so much easier if we could share and then if we could all know um, whose um, children are, you know, impacted as well. Mm -hmm. I also understand the privacy issues. Yeah. So that's the very difficult problem uh, when dealing with this. Yeah. Um, I had a question. You had said at one point, um, beginning of your presentation, that in downtown Atlanta, 13% of the children that you had tested um, were had like high high levels of lead in their blood and so I would just wonder how that compares to other major major urban cities around the U.S. do you know? Oh that's a very good uh, question um, so I think 13 percent is quite high um, the um, I, I should know this but I think 0.5 million children are considered to be uh, having higher than five micrograms of deciliter um, per year, um, but then like that, um, the area where they are impacted really varies. So there was a very nice report um, by the UNICEF recently that I was using quite a bit of figures for this presentation. They, they have done a lot of work on that. And then um, one of the maps that I did not use, um, but was showing how, what areas in the US 
have actually higher population than Flint. And Georgia was shown to be higher than Flint. So that's something, um, there is a lot of data issue that I wasn't pretty clear about and that's why I didn't want to show that. And then um, for the, uh, the um, yeah, we only have looked at Georgia for the uh, blood le levels. So we cannot uh, compare how it might be with other states. Right. Okay. Um, well, thank you. If there are any other questions that anyone thinks of, please just put them in the Q&A um, as we kind of wrap up here. We want to respect everyone's time, so we're approaching the one o'clock hour. Um, so we just have a few final closing remarks. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, just put them in the Q&A and we can address them afterwards. Um, well, we usually we say that we want you to join our Facebook Confluence group, which we totally do, but we are on the last week. But there are several more events that are coming up. Um, we have a documentary screening on Friday called Hidden Rivers that Bailey can tell us a little bit more about if she wants to. Um, and we have our keynote speaker on speaking. His name is Joe Cook and he's speaking on Saturday at 10. So if you're interested in attending either of those virtual events, you can find all that information on our website and register for those sessions. Um, and again, if for some reason you are unable to I, I don't believe the Hidden Rivers documentary, you will be able to view that afterwards, but if you want to be the keynote speaker and you're not available on Saturday, then you could find it on our recordings page of our website. Absolutely. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, I'm going to put in this Hidden Rivers link right now. Um, for those of that are interested in attending, it's going to be a really great session along with all the other ones that we have coming up throughout this week. Um, so, but if you have time on your Friday night to join us um, for a film and a quick introduction from the founder of Freshwaters Illustrated, it will be um, a treat for sure. So um, yeah, I dropped that link in there along with some other links that Jenna was talking about. You can still join our Facebook group and get in on a little bit of those networking opportunities um, while we're still here. Um, but also included in the links is a, um, one to our silent auction. We have one of those every year as a part of Confluence. So you can bid until August 31st. We have some really great items, some Atlanta Botanical Gardens tickets, some mountain getaway, wineries, a little bit of everything for everyone. So please go ahead and check that out when you have the time. Um, at the conclusion of this uh, session, you'll be directed to a survey. Um, so we would really appreciate your feedback on that and um, just let us know what you think. It's quick and five questions. As always, if you're interested in learning more from us about Adoptive Stream or how we're getting involved with Ari and her soil project, please feel free to shoot us an email at any time. Um, we're happy to connect you with Ari or answer any questions that you may have um, about Adoptive Stream. So thank you so much, and um, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Ari, for this talk. It was incredibly interesting and informative. Um, we're really looking forward to, to working on the Citizen Science Project with you, so thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. I maybe just want to chime in here and say that we, for those of, of you who may be adopt stream volunteers or trainers who are interested in getting in the project, we are going to be communicating this information and providing resources, and um, it's not like you won't be able to find the information you need to get involved. So we're kind of in the planning stages of that. So you should be getting more information in the next coming weeks. So just be on the lookout if you're interested in getting involved. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today. Have a nice rest of your day. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Stay safe everybody. <laughs> yeah, bye.